Howdy folks and welcome to the first part of uh, my series where I'm going to be mirroring NASA's space flight history and the Kerbal Space Program. Now as most people know the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union more or less kicked off with the Soviet launch of Sputnik 1 in October of 1957. Americans really couldn't stand having that kind of uh, little communist sphere constantly above their heads beeping away constant reminder that the Soviets had bested us in something. So President Eisenhower ordered the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to get an American satellite into orbit as soon as possible. Unfortunately, the rocket that was picked instead of JPL's rocket was the Navy Vanguard rocket, and that blew up on the launch pad in their first attempt to launch it in true KSP fashion. Uh, and the satellite got labels in the media like Kaputnik and Stayputnik, which incidentally is the name of the spherical probe part in KSP. Um, so instead, they used the a, a modified version of the Jupiter C sounding rocket, which was a suborbital rocket uh, that the military used, and they renamed it for civilian purposes the Juno One. Now, uh, that rocket launched a different satellite, which was called the Explorer One. Uh, in the photo on the left here, you're going to see three gentlemen uh, holding the, the actual satellite. The man on the very left is William Pickering, who is the head of JPL at the time. And the man in the middle is Professor James Van Allen of the University of Iowa. Uh, the man on the very right is Werner Von Braun. You may recognize the name Van Allen, and that's because uh, the belts of radiation encircling the Earth are called Van Allen belts, and they were named after him from discoveries that were made by the scientific instruments that were aboard this satellite. Obviously, von Braun was the former SS colonel in Nazi Germany, who the U.S. whisked away from Germany after the war, and he ended up playing a pretty pivotal role in America's early space program. To the right of them, you'll see a picture of the Juno 1 rocket itself, and also a picture of the rough orbit of the satellite which had a perigee of 357 kilometers and an apogee of 2,562 kilometers. Interestingly, the planned apogee was only uh, six, er, basically 1,600 kilometers, and that, result, that was the result of a slight miscalculation in how much delta V the rocket engines actually produced. It's hard to convert Earth orbits into Kerbin orbits, but uh, I'll give you a uh, slight reasoning behind my uh, estimation here. The uh, perigee altitude is just around the level uh, that the International Space Station currently inhabits, which is around 350 kilometers on average. Uh, so my guesstimation of that altitude in KSP is about 100 kilometers, which is pretty much where um, I put my space stations and uh, parking orbits, and I've seen a lot of other people do that as well. So to give my orbit the same eccentricity uh, as the Explorer 1 with that apo key, or a para key rather, my apo key would be 700, kilometer, 700 kilometers. That will be my goal, uh, as, lo as well as uh, some design parameters that I'm going to set based on the basic mission profile of the Juno 1 rocket, which we'll get to in just a second. Okay, so this is basically just my first attempt at sort of a rough draft of the spacecraft. I decided to use the uh, Stay Putnik piece. Um, I've just popped on a one of the big battery pieces so that it would have its power. And then uh, four antennas there. The actual Explorer 1 did have four antennas coming out of the side. Uh, and then I'm just popping on these uh, Gravitron meters or whatever they're called to simulate the scientific instruments that were aboard the satellite. In reality they actually had a, uh, a Geiger counter, five temperature sensors, and a couple uh, different kinds of micrometeorite detectors, but really none of those things besides the temperature detector are in KSP, so I sort of just threw on three gravitronometer thingamajiggers. Um, now I'm just kind of building the rocket underneath the little probe piece. I figured to use the stack decouplers instead of the um, regular decouplers because it kind of just severs everything cleanly and doesn't make you have um, every all the pieces kind of stuck together afterwards. Notice that I'm putting on those separatrons. Uh, that's because in the actual satellite, it basically went 
the uh, top stage was one uh, solid fuel sergeant rocket. Um, the next stage down was um, a cluster of sergeant rockets. And the next stage down was another cluster of sergeant rockets. And then the next stage down from that was actually a liquid stage. So it pretty much went um, like a small solid stage to uh, I think about six and a half second burning solid stages. And then the main stage was actually the um, liquid stage, which burnt for, I believe, something like two minutes, about 150 seconds or so. Um, so I'm just basically putting on some, uh, some liquid fuel there and uh, a big ol' engine to get up to speed quickly and slap it on some fins. And then I figured the actual rocket didn't have top fins like this, but really in KSP it's pretty much essential to have some sort of air control. I really shouldn't have put them at the very top like this because they're pretty useless up there, but um, decided to try that, Ex naming it the Explorer 1. And I think I'm going to be trying it. Oh no! Uh, this I uh, just uh, throwing together an action group to uh, activate all of the antennas and also the scientific instruments. And here we go. We're gonna launch. Gonna see my fatal mistake here in just a second. And here it starts to veer off because it's a little bit too much of a rough draft. And I did not include an ASAS or an SAS to help uh, the pro piece steer. Here goes the last, uh, the last stage firing. And there's the solid rocket exploding off into the distance. For some reason I triggered the action group, I have no idea why those other two pieces fall. And you're going to see a pretty big explosion. I have no idea why the actual satellite explodes this big, but it's going to go boom. A humongous bottle of fire. So I'm going to go back into the VAB and put an ASAS and an SAS on because those are pretty essential for actually keeping the spacecraft steered without constantly inputting. So here we go. Test 2. That was my Vanguard rocket attempt. This is now my actual Explorer attempt, I guess. And I also uh, started it off at about half throttle because uh, I kind of figured at first that you didn't want the, the full force of the uh, mainsail engine pushing up against uh, the atmosphere, and then it veers off again. The ASAS cannot seem to keep it steady for some reason. I don't know why. So the next thing that I decided to do was maybe mechanicalize it a little bit more. I tried to do a gravity turn uh, just manually, and it really wasn't working. So I threw on a mech jeb unit so that I could just use the uh, smart ASS to keep a constant heading. I'm gonna, you can see, I'm gonna turn off every other feature besides ASAS. Just keep AS, A, ASAS, ASS on, and just use the uh, the surf function to keep a steady uh, heading and pitch and everything to what I wanted. Because my 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 first attempt was really to try to get it. Uh, turning off towards the, the, the water and the coastline to start off with, start the gravity turn a little bit earlier than you usually would because I've got all that thrust. Um, so yeah, I'm pitching it off at like a slight angle right now. And it's actually, it's staying up there. So the, the real problem on that second try was really, I just could not keep the thing steady, but the autopilot's doing a way better job of that. I'm kind of running down on liquid fuel right now. The proportions aren't really the same as the actual flight. Like I said, the, the liquid fuel burnt for probably about a minute and 50 seconds, minute 60 seconds, and then it was only about 6 or 7 seconds each for the, the next two stages, and then uh, a small amount of time for the last stage, and that's really not what happens here, but you kind of can't avoid that if you actually want to um, get this anywhere near the correct altitude because it would just
just gave me way too much delta V. Uh, you can see I had a little bit of another steering problem there, even with the autopilot on after the stage separation. It's kind of struggling just to keep it on the correct heading. I think in just a second I'm going to change the, uh, the target pitch to be a, uh, a little bit lower after this stage here. And uh, yeah, there we go. Change that, execute the pitch change before I start the next stage just to make sure that it's not... Because those, those, uh, those solid rocket motors kind of torque you over to the side a lot. I had a lot of problems in, in some of my iterations with, with those things just completely taking my rocket off, or just from their thrust alone. So it's going to keep it on, keep it on uh, the right heading there. Now it's down to zero heading. You can see the apoapsis is kind of whipping out there. It's definitely not what I wanted. And now we've achieved escape velocity. <laughs> so it's got a little. It's it, it's it's hard because you have those top two solid fuel stages, and you can't throttle back or stop the throttle at all when you're when you're at you know any sort of orbit that you want to keep it at. So this is my final iteration after about a thousand different tries at blowing it up. I've got a nose cone on the top. I've got the kind of hexagonal probe piece with a few uh, doodads off of it, then the battery, then the uh, ever-present uh, uh, ASAS and so on, and then I actually had to add that uh, structural fuselage underneath it to add some weight because that that last big solid fuel stage actually had way too much delta V so I had to increase the amount of non-fuel weight that was on that stage to actually get it right. So this is this is the result of actually way more uh, trial and error than the actual Explorer 1 satellite ever really had. Um, it was uh, it was just really frustrating to try to get these solid rockets at the very top to actually have the right amount of delta V. I ended up having to slap a mech jab on the side to be able to see exactly how much delta V each stage had to eventually get it because I would get up to the, the correct uh, apoapsis and everything and just completely overshoot it and, and get off to escape velocity every time so I finally got it down to to knowing that I needed about 20 per second delta V and just keeping keep adding on weight until I finally got it so you can see uh, on that uh, on that stage separation, the separatrons actually thrusted the uh, the bottom part down because it would keep. I don't know if it was some of the wings or what, but or maybe the weight, but it, it would it would kind of keep accelerating beyond the, the actual active stage of the rocket and just completely move it off off kilter. So I had to add on some separatrons to to kind of push it back down towards the earth, and it still ended up kind of screwing up the the heading and everything as you saw there. You can see some of my earlier attempts falling. It took me so long that I went from like sun up in Kerbin to sun down and like nighttime in Kerbin. And actually the Explorer 1 launch in real life was at night, so that's kind of realistic. But So I've got an apoapsis of about 100,000 uh, meters there, and I'm just setting up a maneuver node to see um, where I need to be point and everything. I actually made a little bit of a mistake here. Um, besides that, which was, it's kind of hard to get the, the node exactly on the apoapsis, but I made a little bit of a mistake here because you can see that I'm going to actually do a, uh, what is it, a normal burn, I think? Let me see what coming up. I think it's a normal burn that I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm doing an anti-normal burn, actually, to get more or less a zero degree inclination, when actually I found out after I recorded all this that the actual Explorer one had about a 30 degree inclination, so that was about right. It was an inclination in the wrong uh, the wrong direction, it was actually in the opposite direction, but that was just about the right inclination that I had uh, by accident, and I, I corrected it again by accident. So now uh, we're going to be coming up on our uh, penultimate burn here. 
uh, trying to stop at about 15 seconds before the maneuver node because the, the solid stages burn in just about 30 seconds. I think it's like 31 seconds. So there's the burn. We're going directly towards the maneuver node heading. And the delta V is slowly going down. You can see it's just about 2400 meters per second, which is just about the delta V that I've got there. There is a little bit of air. You're going to see when I come up on the orbit that it's not exactly what I want. It's not 100 by, by 700, but it's pretty close. It's not bad. I actually even have an opportunity on the last stage because it's such a small little Sepatron two-engine stage to uh, correct it, but you, know, you can't stop the Sepatrons either. The Sepatrons are just going to burn for exactly as long as they want, and then you can see I'm kind of turned back retrograde right now. They've just got too much delta V to get them to bring down the orbit past what you would ideally want. So you you got an apoap or a periapsis there about a hundred, but then the apoapsis is about five hundred thousand meters. But that's pretty good. You can see um, that's that's pretty much what uh what the picture from the uh, from the beginning of the video looked like. And I expanded out the antenna there. The the actual uh, Explorer 1 satellite had these like kind of whip-like antennas that were curved, but we don't have those in, in KSP either. So that's a pretty good, uh, what would you call it, simulacrum of <laughs> what the actual satellite looked like, right up to the nose cone. I thought about using the, um, the nose cone adapter, but it kind of made it too long. It actually would have looked a lot more color-wise like the the Explorer 1 because the Explorer 1 had alternating bands of uh, white and black paint on the sides to, to help with, I guess, uh, thermal conductivity to help with uh, shedding heat off of the satellite. Um, but you can see here, it's actually pretty high off of Kerbin. Um, in real life, they actually did not know whether the Explorer 1 launch had really been a success until it came back around the Earth and uh, they picked it up in California again. So you see we're going around Kerbin. We're going to be coming up on the, uh, the big old crater there in a second. And uh, the actual Explorer 1 satellite stayed up for a pretty long time. Longer than this could stay up because you can see the batteries draining pretty quickly. But it actually stayed up until the 70s and it kept beaming down data, I believe. Um, and then eventually the fact that the, the perigee was so low uh, decayed the orbit. But that's all. That's been my video. In the next video, I'm going to be doing some more NASA history. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you watch my next video, too. I hope you enjoyed yourself.